Welcome to our live stream event. I'm Allison McClarty, the Director of the Lung Cancer Evaluation Center here at Stony Brook Medicine. And I'm delighted to have you join us for this um, information session on exciting developments in lung surgery here at Stony Brook. We're gonna be talking about robot robotic thoracic surgery. And we have with us two experts, uh, Drs. Ankit Demesia, who heads the robotic lung surgery program here at Stony Brook and Dr. Henry Tanous, who's the Chief of Cardiothoracic Surgery here at Stony Brook. So we will jump right in and get started. And we'll start with you, Dr. Demesia. So can you tell us, um, for our viewing audience, what exactly is robotic surgery? Absolutely, actually. Let's uh, look at a slide here. Um, robotic, uh, robotic surgery is more of a tool and not an, a robot actually performing the operation. In fact, um, it's uh, it, the on the left side of the screen here is actually a robotic uh, um, console that actually gets docked to similar to smaller incisions operations, such as people are aware of like laparoscopic or thoracoscopic surgery. And then the surgeon is then once he the trokers are set up, are set up, he's set up, um, he or she is set up relatively close to the patient in the same room right next to them in the surgeon console, which is to the right of the screen here. And using these instruments, we were able to perform the operation right next to you. In fact, these are some of the uh, instruments that are docked to be able to be used, a mixture of instruments to be able to pick um, lung up in a gentle fashion, as well as be able, in a stapler device, to be able to remove and resect certain structures in the chest. So this is all... Um pretty new and exciting technology. So Dr. Tanous, can you tell us currently in the United States, what percentage of lung cancer surgery is done robotically? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think currently the number stands around 50% nationwide. Uh, remember, it took a long way to get here. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, close to 90% of lobectomies were done open and then we transitioned into what we call videoscopic uh, thoracic surgery and uh, in a way robotic surgery is the new kid on the block and uh, it's catching uh, nationwide it's, uh, it's catching up with uh, more than 50 percent of the cases currently being done robotically so that's um a lot of adoption of this technology so with such a significant percentage being uh, done robotically, there must be some significant benefits to this technology. So Dr. Demesia, can you explain for us what are the benefits of this approach? Absolutely. So the console itself allows you to use like a, a 10 times magnification to allow you to then have um, a better precise dissection. Additionally, the, um, it, the adjunct of using your wrists for articulation allows you to not only work deeper into the chest, but also with more precise maneuvers. Um, utilizing the, uh, the, two, um, uh, the two cameras on the edge of the camera port allows you to actually see 3D in the, in the surgeon console when you're there as well. Using these techniques, we're uh, shown to have a lower chance of an open conversion um, a shorter hospital stay, and as I mentioned, a more precise surgical dissection as well. Yeah, and you know, I'd just like to add um, that I was, I've, I've been doing lung surgery for decades now, and I was a little skeptical with early adoption of the uh, robot, but having um, participated in the surgery and seen it in action, the three-dimensional aspect that Dr. Demesia mentions is unbelievable. It's like one is inside the chest with the lung that one is removing. And so it really um, brings the organ that we're working on really, really close to us so that we can be uh, very accurate in its reception. So Dr. Demesia, tell us a little bit more. How exactly is it done? Absolutely. I actually have a video uh, that I wanted to show courtesy of the American Lung Association to help describe and show the um, um, some of the approaches. So as I mentioned, the surgeon is sitting next to the, um, the patient and the patient is being operated on using small console, uh, small incisions via the trocars. Now with the adjunct of CT scans that are catching early and earlier lung cancer, we're able to relatively quickly diagnose lung cancer 
and then subsequently do robotic surgery, which ideally offers a happier patient and a quicker recovery. So we've heard mentioned, um, you know, we're obviously talking about robotic surgery. We've heard mentioned thoracoscopic surgery and the term open lung surgery. So Dr. Tanus, could you clarify for us exactly what that means? Sure. Uh, I think we have a slide that goes with that. So open surgery is a traditional incision that the patient will have from um, their back all the way under the breast. And um, it could be of different length, but the bottom line, it is an open surgery that requires spreading of the ribs. And that comes at a price when it comes to the patient's recovery and the amount of pain um, and how functional they can be afterwards. Um, once we start doing things with the camera, we quickly realize that those patients are recovering faster, they're uh, more um, functional afterward to tolerate further treatment. And that progressed from there into the robotic option that you can see on the screen. And that um, it's multiple small incisions. Uh, the only incision on the robotic uh, patient is um, the uh, opening that we have to create in order to get the specimen out. Sometimes we're able to I get almost one third or one half of the patient's lung through a three centimeter or a one inch incision. But that is the limiting factors of how small the incisions can be with the robot. So it, it sounds like this should be um, the preferential way of doing this for everyone. So, uh, Dr. Demisha, can everybody have this surgery? Or put another way, who is not a candidate for robotic surgery? Patient, it's not uh, for all comers, but patients with um, advanced stage lung cancer often aren't candidates for immediate resection. Um, after they've received preoperative chemotherapy and or immunotherapy, meaning uh, treatment for reduction of the size or decrease of the stage of the cancer, they could become operative candidates, though sometimes that really affects our uh, fields and um, they aren't the ideal candidate for robotic resection. Though we still offer that ability of removing the lung and the lung cancer via an open approach in those circumstances. Yeah, so um, Dr. Tunis, maybe elaborate a little bit on what exactly stage of lung cancer means. And why do we care? Why is the stage of the lung cancer important? Um, I would say staging lung cancer is probably the most important uh, uh, indicator of how well the patient is going to do. Uh, besides the kind of cancer, staging is definitely the number one important um, uh, decision and uh, workup to be done. If a patient is diagnosed with stage one or two, the patient is surgically potentially curable. If the cancer is diagnosed at the later stages, that chance becomes less and less. Unfortunately, throughout um, the US, the majority of lung cancer patients are diagnosed late and um, they're beyond the point where we, surgery can be offered uh, where a cure can be obtained. So if the tumor is localized in the, in the lobe or in the lung and has not spread at all, it's uh, classified as uh, local or stage one or two. If it's spread already to the adjacent lymph nodes, and this is the first stop that the tumor cells will make out of the tumor and into the lymph nodes, then it's already considered uh, stage three, if those lymph nodes are living around the airway. Uh, a distant tumor or a late stage tumor is uh, obviously a poor prognostic uh, 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 sign, and patients will still get treatments, but it will not be surgery. So clearly, then, there's an advantage to finding lung cancer early. 
And I guess this leads us to the concept of lung cancer screening. So screening is done for many diseases. I'm sure many in our audience are used to screening for breast cancer with mammograms and screening for colon cancer with colonoscopies. There is also screening for lung cancer. So Dr. Demisia, can you speak to that a little bit and just explain to us why one should bother with lung cancer screening? Absolutely. So as you had alluded to, lung cancer is a very common cause of, of cancer death. Um, the, um, in addition to that, it is seen very commonly in a lower socioeconomic class. The idea behind lung cancer screening is that um, you would find the cancer sooner, hence at an earlier stage, as Dr. Tanus had mentioned, therefore increasing the likelihood for a complete resection. The um, mortality has been shown to decrease by 20% using lung cancer screening. At uh, Stony Brook, we offer, in addition to that, the lung cancer screening tool. These are patients anywhere between 50 to 80 years old with a 20-pack uh, year history of smoking. Yeah, and I would just like to emphasize, um, as we've heard, that the majority of patients uh, in this country with lung cancer are diagnosed when it's too late for surgery, too late for us to offer that chance of cure. So the, the earlier it's found, the greater the chance of cure, and that is obviously our goal for all our patients. And so, you know, a big plug for the screening program because they do an outstanding job of catching these things early. And uh, some patients who are identified with maybe tiny little spots in their lungs that are too early to be characterized are followed very closely. And, um, and if these things then progress to become a malignancy or a cancer, then we can catch it early and hopefully uh, provide um, a path to cure. All right, so now let's go back again to uh, robotic surgery. So say now, Dr. Demisio, we have a patient and they have an early stage one cancer, as Dr. Tanus alluded to, and you've taken them to the operating room. They've had their successful robotic surgery. Surgery is over. They're in the room in the recovery room. What can they expect in terms of recovery after their robotic surgery? After an, ex, um, an extensive discussion preoperatively uh, to discuss the patient's expectations in the hospital, I also expect them to be able to walk around, if not the same day, then the next day along the halls in the, in the hospital. Um, that is a change from the previous expectation when larger incisions were done. That, in addition to breathing with an incentive spirometer and encouraging physical activity, um, is an expectation while you're in the hospital. Our hospital stay for robotic surgery um, averages between one and three days after the operation. Patients, as long as their chest tube is out um, and they are their pain is tolerable with the pain control regimen that we have discussed and have started, they are able to go home and pursue their daily activities. In fact, they're able to return to work in two to three weeks as long as their expectations are understood to not lift anything greater than or equal to 20 pounds. Yeah, that sounds, um, that sounds great. Um, and so if one is contemplating undergoing robotic surgery, what's the kind of pre-surgical preparation required uh, to be able to have this safely done? Um, maybe Dr. Tunis, you could speak to that. So, um, the preparation uh, that patients need. The bottom line is we want to find out if patients are okay with enough lung reserve after we take part of their lungs out, and we want to make sure that their heart is healthy enough for the surgery. I remember 85% of lung cancer happens in smokers, and smoking not only causes cancer, it could cause other issues, but specifically with the heart. As far as the lungs are concerned, we do what we call the pulmonary function test, and that's going to assess how much reserves the patients have. The gold standard for cancer surgery is a lobectomy. Uh, on the right side, it's equivalent to one-third of the lung. On the left side, it's equivalent to one-half of, the, of their lung. So we want to make sure they have enough lung that they can have a normal life after the surgery. And uh, 
that's what the pulmonary function test uh, will tell us. Uh, as far as the heart being healthy in a smoker, we usually do stress tests or we send them for their cardiologist if they have one to clear them. If their heart is healthy enough for a general anesthesia and the procedure, uh, then they're all cleared in that aspect. Uh, very similar with robotic, even though it's less stressful on their system, but we still go through the same process. So um, you've said that we do tests on the heart and you we do tests on the lungs to make sure that patients are good candidates. So what if the heart test is not, uh, is not um, enough to clear the patient and somebody has a bad heart? Or what if the breathing test shows that the pulmonary reserve is not enough so that patients cannot tolerate surgery? Dr. Mimija, can you just tell us what are other treatment options that might be possible for patients that fall into this category? In the setting of a patient that may not be able to tolerate a resection, um, and or an advanced stage disease, we often take the patient's information and discuss it in a multidisciplinary tumor board. In fact, we often in, in this multidisciplinary tumor board, we have a series of specialists inclusive of pathologists, radiologists, pulmonologists, interventional pulmonologists, um, oncologists, and radiation therapists to help come up with a thorough approach in this setting. Sometimes in the setting of a patient with advanced disease, as I alluded to prior, they can become resectable candidates thereafter. In the setting of a patient that may not be able to tolerate due to their lung function or heart function, they, are, they, the, they can offer them definitive chemotherapy and or radiation options. Yeah. And I would just add to that, you know, um, that for patients who um, uh, require treatment but cannot undergo surgery uh, for their early stage or localized disease, uh, as Dr. Demesia said, there's a multidisciplinary group that, that discusses it. But other treatments that can focus just on the lesion, if that's all a patient has, includes radiation therapy, for example. So these days it's a very focused beam of radiation that is directed to the tumor and even though surgery is considered the gold standard so removing it is considered the gold standard for treating localized cancer like that um, focus beam radiation is an option and also at stony brook we have another treatment option that is sometimes employed called cryoablation therapy so the lesion can either be removed with surgery burnt with radiation or frozen with cryotherapy. So there, there are indeed other ways to um, address these local cancers if patients are not considered surgical candidates. And also, as Dr. Dumizia said, sometimes patients need to be treated with what we call neoadjuvant treatment. So they're given chemotherapy, sometimes with radiation to shrink cancers or to um, uh, eliminate disease that has spread to some of the lymph nodes. And then patients are restaged found now to be surgical candidates, and then we can help with surgery. And to that end, Dr. Tanus, perhaps you could address some of these um, advanced therapies that are used, and also uh, some of the clinical trials that patients may be candidates for here at Stony Brook. Uh, yes, uh, the multidisciplinary board that we conduct every week is a very valuable tool to triage patients. If a patient is being either too sick to undergo surgery, or if the tumor is too advanced, or if the tumor recurred, those patients still have options at Stony Brook. We are conducting multiple clinical trials. So we will fit the patient with the right trial and offer them uh, treatment beyond surgery. And that uh, modality has proven so effective across the country that lung programs, in order to be accredited, they have to have that multidisciplinary board. Um, on top of that, we offer them the clinical trials. And I would also add um, that 
once a patient enters the the um, umbrella of our Stony Brook Lung Cancer Program, uh, after surgery, patients are um, placed in our lung cancer database. And this is um, a, a multi-decade long database that has been established here at Stony Brook, where um, we follow our patients very, very closely. So once one has undergone um, surgical treatment here, uh, patients are followed for years and years and years so that we can track one how you're doing and two make sure that no cancer recurs and if unfortunately it does recur then we can get patients in to have adjunctive treatment uh, very promptly so that is a very powerful tool that we have here that we can also offer to our patients um, now, uh, Dr. Demesia, we've talked a lot about lung cancer surgery, but we know that within the chest, which is our area of expertise, there are other organs that sit just by the lungs. There's the esophagus or swallowing tube, there's the trachea or breathing tube. Are any of these other organs um, uh, amenable to surgical treatment with the robot? Absolutely, so using the robotic platform, you can treat or remove many of structures within the chest cavity. We often work on the mediastinum to remove mediastinal tumors, which is the space between your chest and your spine, somewhat in the center of your chest. Additionally, we also, as you had alluded to, um, remove, remove masses in, in and around the esophagus, as well as reconstruct the esophagus when you have esophageal cancer. In addition to that, we have access to the breathing tube, which is the trachea, and can do um, operations to help manipulate, to treat, or resect that area as well. That alludes to most of the intra-chest tumors and masses, but in addition to that, we can also do chest wall tumors as well. In fact, um, oftentimes uh, thoracic outlet disease often requires a rib resection to help um, treat the problem that hand, and that is an additional location and um, uh, symptom that can be treated with robotic surgery. Yes, and I will just add to that um, by recalling a patient that we actually used the robot um, to treat a couple of weeks ago, a patient who had a large cystic mass in her chest, and normally this would be resected either with a sizable incision, as Dr. Tanu showed us earlier, or even with the telescope, uh, the resection would have been tricky because it was a big cyst and it extended up uh, from the top of the chest up into her neck. With the use of the robot, we were able to mobilize the cyst and dissect all the way up into her neck. And again, as I said, when one uses the robot with the three-dimensional reconstruction of images, it's like you're right there in the chest. And so it was as if we were moving with our instruments all the way up the chest and into her neck, and we were able to remove this structure in its entirety, um, identifying nerves and other structures that were nearby and safely um, resecting the mass. So it really has proven to be an outstanding tool, not just for lung cancer, but for many other pathologies that we find in the chest. Um, so um, we um, certainly welcome questions from our audience. And um, I, uh, I am going to um, share a question from Emily, um, who says that, um, Patients, um, oh, here it is. So I'll just read Emily's question. It says, this is great information. Uh, some patients may find robotic assisted surgery daunting or scary. So Dr. Demesia, if you have a patient come in who has heard what we've had to say, is intrigued by the process, but is scared about uh, submitting to the technological advancement of this, this technique, what would you have to say that might reassure them? Oftentimes when someone uses the term robot, um, my patients often get a little concerned, like where is my surgeon during this period? Is the, sur is the robot itself actually the, what, going, what is going to be um, operating on them? But I just, I think it's important to understand that, you know, we're right there with you the entire time. We're gonna walk with you through this process. The robotic platform is just a tool to be able to help you and your patients and the problem that's at hand. 
and that at the end of the day, you know, we're dwelling on this pathway together and um, and I'm going to be there right by you the entire time. Actually, our last slide here would be a great kind of point here. You know, it's um, um, that's um, me on the robotic consult um, right next to the patient in the same room. And at the same time, more importantly, on the right side, you got to understand that we aren't alone here. We have a, a team here, a dedicated team and group to help you in the process through this. And and you may never know that this is going on in the operating room, but you must understand that we're all here for you and we're going to get you through this. Yeah. So I think that's a great slide to show that it's a team that takes care of patients. And as as um, viewers can see, sometimes it's quite a sizable team that's involved in making sure that things are safely conducted. Now, we had talked about, you know, what makes someone eligible for um, robotic surgery. So, uh, Dr. Tunus, are there exclusions um, based on age? Like, can somebody be too old for robotic surgery or too young for robotic surgery, would you say? I don't think there's uh, an age restriction on uh, robotics. In fact, the older the patient, the less you want the surgery to be invasive and stressful on their system. So I would argue that the more frail or uh, deconditioned the patient is, the less invasive the surgery should be. Uh, but it's also important to end um, with few facts. A uh, few facts, the first fact is smoking cessation saves lives. Another fact is uh, curative lung cancer surgery saves lives and identifying tumors in early stages saves lives. So uh, if we can just leave our listener with just these three uh, facts, uh, I think we would have helped someone on Long Island uh, who uh, is a smoker who qualifies for lung cancer screening to get their screening done. And even if they were told their tumor is advanced, they're welcome to call us for a second opinion. Uh, we offer um, routinely second opinions for patients who seek help elsewhere and were told one thing and we'll give them our own honest opinion. Yeah, so that is um, an excellent thought on which to end. I'll just ask, um, I'll just mention one other uh, point that I see here in the um, comment section. Someone is asking, what if lung cancer screening started even earlier? You know, recently the age was brought down to 50 years. Um, so should it be, should we start screening patients at 30 years, at 40 years? Uh, Dr. Demesia, what do you think? Is there any utility to pushing it? Or um, should perhaps more effort be used, as Dr. Tunu said, in uh, education about uh, smoking cessation? I, I do agree there should be more education out there for smoking cessation, um, which we also offer here at Stony Brook. Um, as of right now, there hasn't shown any evidence in screening um, any earlier than 50 years old. And, you know, the more screening we have, the also the increased risk occurs as well. Oftentimes we follow nodules that are small in origin and we end up giving patients more and more CAT scans, which may, which may subject them to radiation. So it's a risk balance at, at a certain point. As of right now, though, as I mentioned, the um, evidence seems to show that at 50 age, 50 years of age um, is when you are most optimal to decrease the risk and optimize from the benefit of the lung cancer screening in terms of CT scans and their uh, side effects. All right, great. So I think there's one final question before we wrap up. And um, the question is that, you know, recovery time obviously is what everyone is concerned about after uh, a thoracic procedure. So how do we get patients ready for this? Now, perhaps this would be a good time, um, Dr. Demesia, for you to just touch on the ERAS uh, program that is uh, uh, being employed here at Stony Brook. 
Absolutely. So an ERAS program is a system that is set up to optimize patients in terms of not only their knowledge associated with what is going to happen such that they participate more in their care, but also a multimodality pain regimen to allow patients to progress in a more predictive fashion while in the hospital and then subsequently at home. The process starts from when they first are seen by us in our clinic followed by our preoperative visit with our nurse practitioners to discuss and to teach patients about what their process is going to be like. In addition to that, they'll receive a log and a journal to be able to help document and participate in their care. Studies have shown that when patients are, are participating in their own care, meaning are taking an active part in it, not a passive part in it, they seem to not only recover better, but also progress back to work in a more expeditious fashion and have decreased pain requirements in terms of pain control. So we have implemented an ERAS protocol here to be able to help in this process. Excellent. And so, you know, just to wrap up, um, we've talked about lung cancer, lung cancer surgery, uh, lung cancer screening, and uh, different ways of um, treating patients who have this disease process, whether it's early or late. But I would just emphasize, as Dr. Tanous mentioned, that really the best thing is to try to avoid to have lung cancer uh, in the first place. And therefore, smoking cessation is critical. And it is never too late to stop smoking. I've had patients tell me, you know, I've been smoking for few years. Uh, why bother? No. And, and the answer is that it's never too late because... Um, the additive effect of continuing smoking is, is brutal on the lungs, damaging normal lung structure and setting one up for much uh, higher incidences of advanced lung cancer. So thank you all for joining us. And I'd like to thank our experts, Dr. Sunus and Demisha. And we would be happy to take care of you or any of your family members here at Stony Brook in our uh, uh, thoracic lung cancer center. So have a great evening, everyone, and thanks again for joining us.